Um, Dr. Catalone is a researcher and a highly regarded prostate cancer surgeon, having performed more than 6,000 nerve-sparing radical prostatectomies. He's professor of urology and director of the Clinical Prostate Cancer Program at Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center, different than this building, which is the research building um, here at Northwestern University. Dr. Catalone is known for having been the first to show that a simple blood test called PSA is the most accurate method for detecting prostate cancer and for having helped develop the free PSA test as a means of improving the accuracy of prostate cancer screening. More recently, Dr. Catalona led the research involved in a newer blood test called the Prostate Health Index. How many have heard of the Prostate Health Index? Okay, well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the Prostate Health Index is a combination of PSA, free PSA, and pro-PSA. And I think there's a more scientific way to say that, but I'm using my um, plain English terminology. This test has been shown to be more specific. We talked about sensitivity and specificity, correct? specific to prostate cancer than PSA alone, thereby helping patients and doctors to make more informed biopsy decisions, because biopsy is the only thing that truly diagnoses, which we also talked about. He is the author of more than 500 um, articles in scientific journals, books, and book chapters in medical texts with awards, titles, and accolades too numerous to mention, as you can see. So please welcome Dr. Catalona. Thank you, Jan. Uh, good morning. I, I wanted to uh, just begin by um, pointing out that um, in Chicago we have a spore in prostate cancer, uh, the only one in Chicago, the only one in Illinois. Uh, SPORE stands for a Specialized Program of Research Excellence in Prostate Cancer. And here it involves the Northwestern University, the University of Chicago, and the North Shore uh, systems. So uh, these three medical centers are engaged in this. Um, and um, the, uh, the administrators uh, are myself as a principal investigator, Dr. Walter Stadler, uh, who's at the University of Chicago as a co-principal investigator, and Dr. Robin Lakin, uh, who is the scientific administrator of the SPORE, and uh, Catherine Lewitt. And we talk about um, targeted therapy. Uh, SPORE, projects, SPORE programs usually have four projects, and we have four projects on targeted therapy for prostate cancer. Uh, the first uh, project is looking for genetic variants uh, that will predict which patients will fail active surveillance and which patients um, will succeed on active surveillance. And then there are three uh, projects uh, looking at targeted therapy for men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer using, um, using different, uh, uh, attacking different signaling pathways that can make prostate cancers grow after they become resistant to androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, and uh, these projects, um, uh, th here's a major project uh, from the University of Chicago. Here's another one from uh, Northwestern and the University of Chicago together, working together on this project. Uh, and the third project, again, is, um, is a project uh, look, targeting uh, a, a using new drugs to target uh, a signaling pathway in patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, the SPORE also has a biostatistical core uh, to help uh, the researchers work on these projects, a biospecimen core that collects specimens uh, from prostate cancer patients, and a developmental research program. These are basically um, programs uh, which, which are training awards for young investigators and a, a career development program as well. So we have pilot projects and career developments. And um, SPORE also has um, lay advocates uh, who are very important uh, to keep us all grounded. And uh, we are always interested in, uh, in lay advocates. and. Uh, uh, I've been sitting in the back of the room listening to some of the discussions, and some of you seem to be 
very, very knowledgeable about prostate cancer, and if any of you would be interested to participate as a lay advocate in our SPORE program, we would be delighted to talk to you. So moving uh, quickly on uh, to the Prostate Health Index, um, this is um, a new blood test that was um, approved uh, by the FDA and is now uh, generally available in the United States. Um, as, J as Jan mentioned, uh, the, the studies that led to FDA approval were done here, and uh, we were actually the first um, site to be allowed to use the program. We started, it, we started using this test in April uh, at Northwestern. Uh, by way of disclosure, um, I, I would say that I have um, had a long-standing uh, research uh, arrangement with um, Beckman Coulter, which is the manufacturer of the Prostate Health Index, and uh, have received honoraria and, uh, ex and the research expenses uh, from Beckman Coulter. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, what the FDA approved uh, is the five tests are intended to be used as an aid in distinguishing uh, prostate cancer from benign disease in men who are over 50 and have a total PSA in the 4 to 10 nanogram range and a negative digital rectal exam. So um, th this, is th this is what, what would be the approved indications. Our studies show that it goes far beyond this, that it is, uh, it is also um, uh, very robust in men who have PSAs between 2 and 4, and as I'll point out in the presentation, uh, it also uh, is more uh, specific for identifying men who, are have, who have aggressive uh, prostate cancer. Uh, the test is uh, now available in the United States, and uh, the company, the diagnostic laboratory that does it is the Innovative Diagnostic Laboratory in Minnesota. We draw blood here at Northwestern, and we have to send it off uh, to Innovative, and we usually get the results back in 10 days uh, to two weeks. Um, uh, just to give you a little background on prostate cancer, uh, 233,000 new cases. Uh, in 2014, uh, fewer than in the past, uh, and some of this is due to decrease in PSA screening. It accounts for 27% uh, of all cancers. It's the most common uh, non-skin cancer in men. One in seven men are diagnosed with prostate cancer during their lifetime. It accounts for uh, almost 30,000 deaths in the United States and the number of deaths per year has been going down since the beginning of the um, PSA era. It's, a, it's responsible for 10% of cancer deaths, second only to lung cancer. Uh, we've been talking a lot about false positives and false negatives, and uh, the uh, PSA is far from a perfect test. Um, inflammation and benign enlargement of the prostate are common causes for false positives, and false negatives uh, occur because some very aggressive prostate cancers are so aggressive that they have forgotten how to produce PSA, and so that they don't uh, produce um, uh, very much PSA. And so because of the false positives and false negatives, um, the uh, there's the diagnosis and treatment of some tumors that would not have caused harm, so-called overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Um, the, uh, in the prostate cancer screening trials, uh, in terms of level one evidence, this is level one evidence. Uh, in this trial from Europe reported in the New England Journal, they showed that um, uh, PSA screening reduced the prostate cancer death rate by 21%, and if by, it was 29% if you adjusted for the people who did not uh, comply with the protocol. And in the patients who had the longest follow-up, there was a 38% reduction in the prostate cancer-specific mortality rate. As you can see from these mortality curves, uh, it takes them time to separate. So you really get very little separation for the first seven years. And then with longer follow-up, you see greater benefits. Um, the, uh, the best screening trial that's ever been done is the Goatborg screening trial 
in Sweden, where the men were screened more frequently with lower PSA uh, cutoffs. And in this trial, there was a 44% <clears throat> reduction in the prostate cancer-specific mortality rate. And if you looked at the men who were actually screened and complied with the protocol, uh, there was a 56% reduction. So I think the bottom line is that PSA screening, if done properly, can reduce the prostate cancer death rate by at least 50% uh, with long-term follow-up. Now, I put this slide in to show that um, one of the common PSA cutoffs used is four, and many doctors will not recommend a biopsy unless the PSA is higher than four, but this is uh, from the prostate cancer prevention trial, looking at men whose PSA was from zero to four, and you can see that, um, that uh, almost 25% of men with PSAs above two have prostate cancer, and of those, uh, about 20% uh, of these are high-risk uh, prostate cancers. So, um, as has been mentioned here this morning, uh, the, in, in May of 2012, the U.S. Preventive T Services Task Force came out against PSA screening in any man of any age of any race. Uh, but since that time, there have probably been seven or eight uh, guidelines released by other major um, uh, medical organizations, including the American Cancer Society, American Society of Clinical Oncology, uh, et cetera, and almost, and virtually every other one of them have come out recommending screening in, in, in certain uh, groups of men. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, issued uh, a statement uh, at that time that uh, that we do need uh, a better test uh, than PSA uh, for, uh, for screening for prostate cancer. And since that time, there have been a flurry of tests that have come out. Some of them are simple blood tests, others are urine tests, some of them are complicated and expensive genetic tests. And one of these uh, tests that has been uh, cleared by the FDA is the uh, Prostate Health Index. So the, uh, the prostate, the thing that distinguishes the prostate health index from what is currently available commercially is that it measures the minus two pro PSA, which is a, um, which is a form of PSA that can be measured in the blood. So uh, if, you, um, if you consider PSA circulating in the blood, most of the PSA is, is bound to proteins and uh, a small fraction of PSA is free-floating. And, uh, and so if you get a blood test today at most hospitals, they, they can give you the free and total PSA. But in this compartment of free PSA, there are also three components. One of them is called intact PSA, or sometimes called IPSA, that is actually increased with benign disease and decreased with prostate cancer. And then there's another fraction called BPHA, which is also increased with benign disease, but decreased with cancer. And then there are three types of pro-PSA, minus two, minus four, and minus five. And it is the minus two pro-PSA that is a new biomarker that is actually much more specific for prostate cancer, and it's more specific for the aggressive forms of prostate cancer. And so the, um, the, the new uh, blood test gives you, tells you what the total PSA, what the free PSA is, and what the, percent, what the uh, minus two pro PSA is in a mathematical formula that gives you a risk estimate for whether or not a biopsy would show prostate cancer. And as Dr. Odo pointed out, that in the zones of the different zones of the prostate, in the peripheral zone of the prostate, uh, this is where 70% of cancers occur, and if one actually measures minus two pro PSA, one finds uh, it concentrated in this region of the prostate. And so these are all of the different, um, the different forms of PSA within a prostate cell, and, uh, and, and uh, through degradation by enzymes, the pro PSA diffuses in the blood and can be measured um, 
in a very sensitive and very specific um, uh, blood test assay. And uh, some of our, we initially started uh, studying uh, pro-PSA uh, back in, in, in 2000, actually even before the year 2000, but this was one of our papers in 2002 showing that as the percentage of, uh, as, of minus two pro-PSA increases in the blood, the likelihood that the patient will have cancer increases in the blood and as shown in the gray bars, the likelihood that the cancer would be a high-grade aggressive prostate cancer also increases. And the mathematical formula is this, they call it phi, prostate health index, and it's the pro-PSA divided by the free PSA times the square root of the total PSA. And, in, and it seems like uh, one of those mathematical formulas that would make your eyes glaze over, but actually there's intuition in it because uh, the, the higher your PSA is and the higher your pro-PSA is, the more likely you have cancer. And the lower the free PSA is, the more likely you have cancer. So this just assembles these with, with the risk factors in the numerator and the denominator, and, and this magnifies the predictive ability of this. So um, uh, what, what it does is it uh, helps discriminate cancer from benign disease. It improves the specificity for prostate cancer uh, detection and is associated with more aggressive disease. So uh, when I gave this, uh, this talk at the American Urological Association meeting, I, uh, we included some uh, questions in here. This was given to physicians to see whether they were following what, what we said. And uh, so what are the components of phi? And it is PSA, uh, free PSA, and pro-PSA. So survey question. Uh, when recommending a prostate cancer test to patients, how important is it that the test is FDA approved? And, um, and it, it is very important because a test that is FDA approved has been through the crucible of the FDA. And I, I, and I, I can't emphasize enough how difficult it is to get a, a blood test or any test approved by the FDA. A lot of these other tests are not approved uh, by, the, uh, by the FDA. So um, uh, the, uh, what I put up here is several of the tests that are available uh, now for uh, as newer tests that are more helpful than, PA, uh, than the PSA test. And you can see only the PHI and the PCA3 urine test uh, have, a, have achieved um, FDA approval. Um, and uh, the other ones uh, are, are not FDA approved. Now, um, the, uh, the initial clinical study that was uh, presented to the FDA was a multi-center study involving uh, universities uh, around the United States and, um, and e even in, um, in Europe. Uh, and um, and th this study, uh, I'm going to show you some of the data for this. Um, and, and basically what it showed is at, um, at a sensitivity of 80 to 95 percent, this means that if you can considering the ability to detect 80 to 95 percent of cancers, uh, the specificity of the phi test was greater than of PSA and, um, and uh, the percent free PSA. And, um, and if, if you had an increasing phi, uh, there was a 4.7 fold increased risk of having prostate cancer and a 1.6 fold increased risk of having the high Gleason grade uh, prostate cancer. And, and, and importantly, phi was not associated with age and it was not associated with prostate volume so that it's not influenced as much by the patient's age or the patient's prostate volume as is the regular uh, PSA test. And these are called ROC curves and the more curved, uh, the more curved that, that they are, the more accurate they are in predicting things and this shows the PSA, the percent free PSA, and the phi of being um, more accurate for predicting prostate cancer. 
And it's, if you look at the relative risk of having prostate cancer, if the phi test is very low, it would be a low percentage, and as the phi test increases, it would be an increased um, likelihood that the patient would have prostate cancer. And even before doing a biopsy, you can, you can use the phi test um, to predict whether it would be an aggressive cancer. For example, if you had a patient who had a PSA of 4 and he had a phi value that was less than 25, then there'd be only a 3% chance that he would have a high-grade prostate cancer. But if his phi were greater than 55, there would be a 22% that he would have a Gleason grade 7 or greater prostate cancer. And I put this slide in just to show you that, um, that in our, the studies we did for the FDA, we, we, um, we used patients whose PSAs were between 2 and 10. And, and the curves are absolutely superimposable so that uh, the phi test was as robust in the 2 to 4 range as it was in the 4 to 10 range. But the FDA just could not swallow approving uh, a blood test uh, for men who had a PSA less than 4. It was just the political climate was such that uh, they did not want to liberalize PSA testing guidelines any more than they had already uh, been established. Uh, this was an important study that we carried out in Chicago uh, where we, we did screening all throughout the city and we screened uh, 3,000 men and, uh, and showed that the phi test worked in a grassroots population. And the reason this is important is sometimes uh, when people are developing a blood test and they pull their blood samples out of the freezer, the blood test looks great because they're dealing with very selected samples. But when you get it out in the real world, uh, in a grassroots population, it may not perform as well. And this showed that it, it worked as well in the gra grassroots population as it did in a clinical trial population. Um, so uh, the phi test is not only good for uh, predicting cancer in patients who are having their um, uh, initial biopsies, uh, but uh, they, uh, it was also good for, um, for repeat biopsies or extended biopsies. And this is a, a large study from Italy uh, showing that the phi and the minus 2 pro PSA were the more, most accurate predictors of prostate cancer. Um, this um, is um, another study, again, a large multi-center evaluation of uh, the phi test in Europe, uh, showing that it had uh, it was the most accurate predictor uh, that they used with the largest area under the curve. So phi has been widely approved uh, all over the world. Uh, phi is, uh, has been shown to be uh, cost effective in terms of reducing unnecessary biopsies uh, because of its increased accuracy, and this is a uh, cost-effectiveness study that was published. Um, this is very important. This is uh, a study from, um, from Johns Hopkins. Uh, Johns Hopkins has a, an active surveillance program. And uh, so, so they have these men, who all of whom appear to have low-risk prostate cancer, and they're enrolled in an active surveillance program. And they tested uh, a number of uh, markers to see who could predict the risk of men who would fail active surveillance and have progressive disease. And, um, and so they found that uh, the phi test uh, uh, predicted the risk of biopsy progression from Gleason 6 to Gleason 7 degree uh, disease in an active surveillance population. And this, this study was recently um, validated in a separate study in Japan. And interestingly, in this study, the PCA3 test um, uh, could not uh, predict which patients would progress on active surveillance. So again, another question to test your knowledge. What clinical settings has the five been reported to, pre, uh, to predict outcome in published data? And, um, and so uh, here we have for initial biopsy, for repeat biopsy, for active surveillance, all of the above. Now, integrating phi uh, into clinical practice. Um, so these are the countries that have, uh, around the world, that have uh, 
given the five test uh, regulatory uh, approval. And so, um, so these are, these countries all have sort of their counterparts of our FDA. And um, so what does the report look like? So when you send it off, uh, you just draw a simple uh, tube of blood like you would for a PSA test and you send it off and it gives you what the patient's total PSA is, what his free PSA is, what his pro PSA is, what his percent PSA is, and what his phi score is. And so in this particular patient, had a uh, phi score of 6.3, and that tells, that tells you that he would, there'd be 11% probability, or if you did a biopsy, you know, one chance in nine that the biopsy would come back showing prostate cancer. So this would be kind of an example of a low risk patient. Now here's another patient. So if we, uh, so and the, the interesting thing about our first patient is his total PSA was 10. And you know, we would, you'd really think a patient with a PSA of 10 would be very likely to have prostate cancer, but he has only one chance in nine of having a positive biopsy. Now here's a patient whose total PSA is 4.4 and uh, his percent uh, free PSA is 21%. And again, with a PSA of 4.4 and a percent free PSA of 21, that would not be highly suspicious for prostate cancer. But when you throw in the, um, the, the pro PSA, his phi score is 97, and that translates to a one chance in two that his biopsy would show prostate cancer. So two different cases in which the first would seem to have a, a higher risk for prostate cancer, and the second would have a lower risk. The phi completely uh, converts those results. So um, the uh, NCCN, National Comprehensive Cancer Center, guidelines are, are widely used uh, to, uh, to uh, sort of direct physicians in treatment of various cancers. And um, in March of this year, uh, the NCCN uh, NCCN issued new guidelines for early prostate cancer detection, and the PHI test um, uh, was, include, was recommended in the NCCN guidelines, uh, saying a PHI value of um, greater than uh, 35, one should seriously consider prostate cancer. So um, again, this is a question, which of these tests are included in the NCCN guidelines, and again, the PHI test and the PCA3 urine test are included in the guidelines. And probably a major reason for them including it is because they're both FDA approved. So um, last year there was a um, prostate cancer, an international prostate cancer con uh, congress um, in uh, Melbourne, Australia, uh, in which uh, they issued a consensus conference statement on prostate cancer screening testing. And um, they said the PSA test should not be considered on its own, but as part of a multivariable approach. And again, in this, they mentioned the PHI can help better risk stratify men, potentially reducing overdiagnosis and overtreatment of indolent prostate cancer. Um, there's um, on the internet, what is sometimes used is the prostate cancer prevention trial risk calculator uh, in which a patient can log on to the site and you can put in your race, your age, your PSA, your family history, your digital rectal exam findings, prior prostate biopsy history, and it will calculate your risk. And uh, the recently the uh, percent free PSA and the, and the minus two pro PSA or phi has been added into this risk calculator. And this just simply shows uh, how you, you put the phi value in there and it can tell you that your risk is 52% or in this case, uh, 20%. So um, these are some illustrative cases. Uh, so this is a 65 year old man. He has no family history of prostate cancer. His prostate is enlarged, normal is 30, his is 50. He has no suspicious nodules. His PSA is 4.6, you know, would you perform a biopsy in this man? And um, 
He has uh, a phi of 21. Uh, there's uh, less than a 10% risk of prostate cancer, less than a 3% risk of Gleason greater than seven disease. Some of these men would say they're not gonna get the biopsy. They'll follow that along. Here's a 60-year-old man. Again, no family history of prostate cancer. He's had a 12-core biopsy uh, last year that was negative. His PSA was 4.1. His current PSA is now 4.3. His prostate exam is still normal. Would you re repeat the biopsy in this man? It's a year later. He doesn't want to have another biopsy because the biopsy last year wasn't particularly fun. Uh, his uh, phi is 57. In our pivotal study, there's greater than a 50% risk of prostate cancer and a 22% risk of high-grade disease and I think most people under those circumstances would recommend repeating the biopsy. This is a 66-year-old man. He's in an active surveillance program for three and a half years. When he joined the program, his PSA was 3.8. He had Gleason 3 plus 3 and 5% of two cores. At 18 months, his PSA has now gone up to 4.2. Prostate exam is still normal. Um, repeat biopsy again just so showed uh, two cores of low volume prostate cancer. Uh, would you repeat the biopsy now? His phi is 21, uh, meaning less than a 3% chance that he has high grade prostate cancer. Can you delay the next biopsy? Yes, and this would be a patient where the multi parametric MRI scan also would be very helpful. This is a 55-year-old man. He has uh, no remarkable clinical history. His PSA is four, his rectal exam is normal. Uh, he's reluctant to have a biopsy because his brother had a biopsy and his brother had a bad experience with the biopsy. Would you biopsy this 55-year-old man? Uh, he had a uh, phi of 70. Uh, that means he has uh, greater than a 50% chance of having prostate cancer, greater than 22% of high risk. Yes, even though his brother had a bad time with his biopsy, he should have a biopsy. And um, this is a 45-year-old African-American male, no family history. His PSA value is only 2.8. He's never had any other PSA test, no, no prior biopsy, normal feeling prostate, um, would you recommend a biopsy in this patient? Bias 62, high risk of cancer, high risk of Gleason grade disease. Yes, you would recommend a biopsy. So um, it's um, changing uh, the, the paradigm of, um, of prostate cancer screening. Um, we, we need new biomarkers. Um, we need new biomarkers to increase the specificity of prostate cancer. I think MRI is, is going to be helpful in this, but again, as, as came out in the discussion here, the MRI is good. It's the best imaging test, but it's far from perfect. It, uh, it misses some cancers and it, and, it, and it suggests cancers when they're not there. So PHI has um, the potential to improve prediction of prostate cancer and it should be um, considered uh, with, as part of a multivariable approach. So um, <clears throat> men uh, currently are in this country are confused about whether they should be screened, when they should be screened, what is a normal uh, uh, PSA test. And there, at the AUA meeting, they had a, a session for the lay public uh, to try to uh, get, bring clarification uh, to this with uh, prostate cancer advocates. And they, um, one of their conclusions was that um, the PHI test represents uh, an advancement. Uh, it improves upon um, our ability to predict prostate cancer and that there are going to be other biomarkers in the future that are going to be very helpful in this area. So they uh, actually had, um, this is very interesting, they actually had a booth at the AUA meeting and um, 
where they um, provided free pot, uh, uh, buy tests to uh, men who wanted to participate. And one of my colleagues, who is a researcher at Beckman Coulter that developed the phi test, got a phi test. And uh, a few weeks after the AUA meeting, he called me up and his phi test was, was abnormal. And it was uh, so, and he was subsequently evaluated and found to have prostate cancer. So, you know, even, even among the developers of the assays, uh, it can be, uh, it can be surprising sometimes. So it's available, and uh, for more information on it, it's on the website, Innovative Diagnostics Laboratories. Patients should be able to get this anywhere in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Catalano.